First of all, isn't it a beautiful day out there today? Oh my goodness, to just His goodness, His goodness, His goodness. So good to see everybody this morning. We already high five. we already hugged. We're doing the valley thing this morning, aren't we? Do you feel refreshed like you've been blessed? Like, you know, for me, when it's like worship is so, so, so important, I feel like that's where, I, that's where I get a chance to charge my batteries, to get filled up, get my hands raised up, sometimes start to feel them, be, begin to tingle. It's like, oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So good, so good. Love, love, love to worship Him. Jason said, <laughs> it's, it's just interesting that I share that. Jason Stiba was just telling me, he said, I, I, I really love the teaching on Wednesday evenings, Pastor Lynn, but he said, man, I surely do miss the worship. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So valuable, so important. I was like, and I feel so uncomfortable trying to sit around this little table when I'm used to standing at the... <laughs> to sit. You can stand. I can stand. We tried something different. So welcome to the, the new experience of doing like this. We'll see if it works or if it doesn't. It's going to work great. We're just turning it over to Holy Spirit. He's in control here anyway. So, uh, One of the things last week that I had, had, had talked about was that we, we wanted to lay out, begin to lay out a little bit of what 2021, really what, what God has put on our hearts, what He's kind of shown us. And one of those things that I want to let, kind of let the cat out of the bag right off the bat, we're going to be, there are s several things that will be changing, tweaking just a little bit. And it's so, I, I, I even, I, you've heard, blah, 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 blah. come on, Lynn, you can do this. It is so about his presence. There's nothing that we're changing. It's all about the presence of God hosting His presence, hosting it well, and loving on one another. When you come to Valley Church, you certainly, my expectation is that your expectation is you're going to end up experiencing and feeling and basking in the presence of God and being loved on by the people and feeling that love. Anybody been disappointed in that? Right answer. Right answer. So that's something that is paramount. That's center of who we are, what we believe. And it's like, it's all about His presence. It's about His presence. There are some things that we really decided uh, that I felt like the Lord laid on my heart that I shared with staff. And then when we talked about at a retreat a little over a week ago, a week and a half, or two weeks ago. And in that I said, you know, we, we have been doing what the Lord has, has laid on our hearts. We've been... Uh, even as we discuss in staff meetings, it's that it's our responsibility to create, for, for us to be the atmosphere changers, for us to be creating an atmosphere for everyone to be able to have their own encounter, a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, yes. feeling, sensing the presence of God, the love of God. We feel like that's something that we've, we've really focused on, and we've actually done pretty well at that. Uh, everybody that agrees, this would be a great time to say amen or clap your hands or something. It's like, ah, thank you, I'm feeling better already, getting good, more good. comfortable. But some of the, what we really, really, really want to do is that focus a lot more this year as we kick it up on community, on, on building community, inclusiveness and, and community. It's like, Reaching out, where, where we start to, where we're doing life together, not necessarily in one big group, but outside the walls of the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And one of the things, big steps that we've taken and that we have done is there's this young, young gentleman, and, and when I spoke this a couple of months ago, had no idea that it actually was this close. I introduced one of the three amigos, as I said, I'm speaking this prophetically, Matthew Forsyth. We just want to welcome up here. I'd just like him to stand up, everybody to take a look. And it's like, <laughs> February 1, he's going to be joining full-time staff. <laughs> so 
So we will have an installment. I've definitely uh, let that leak out big time now. So he will be installed shortly after the first of, of, of February, where we're going to, you know, celebrate this this big this big thing that this big accomplishment, this big step that we're taking. And there's a lot of things that he's going to be undertaking and overseeing. So we're very very excited about that. Yes. God's good. He has given us enough finance to expand one more awesome. expansion. It's amazing. So amazing. One of the things that, that I had, had talked about and discussed in, in depth uh, up there uh, in the mountains was two words, well, three words from discipled to disciplers. Discipled to disciplers. One of the things that we're really going to be working on and giving everybody opportunity, we're all called to be disciples, right? And as disciples, as disciples, as we continue to receive and to be discipled, it's time that we also start to disciple others. Yeah. So moving from being discipled to disciplers, gathering, doing life together yeah. with others and being able to share with them what God's put on our hearts, what he's done for us, our testimonies, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything you want to add really quick? Go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, okay. keep going. Uh, I heard some, some comments behind me when Pastor Tim jumped up here and said, we're doing a men's event. This is going to be a Super Bowl thing. And I heard a couple of women saying, what? What? So you, uh, no wonder he ran out of here so quick. He must have heard it too. Uh, I'm guessing that the, John is this is this men only is, it, is this something that women can can come to? There are a lot of football fans that you know. Are we invited if we bring food? <laughs> well, I heard three yeahs out there. So you know what? I, I think that uh, we want to be politically correct in everything we do here, don't we? Oh I know. no. <laughs> Do you love how quickly you got booed? That blessed my that heart. Was, that was the church so, boo. That was, that was so funny, wasn't it? <laughs> boo. First time I've ever been booed up here. <laughs> I've had gasps. I've had people shake their head. That was a big boo from the whole crowd. Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, babe. Okay. Are we ready to get started in the Word? Um, you know, when we were, I'm going to back one, say one more thing, ramble just a little bit longer. Last Wednesday in prayer meeting, I was back there worshiping for a, a short amount of time with them. I had 20 minutes or so to go back there, and, and uh, it's right when they started worshiping. And it, as they're beginning to worship, I ended up getting, getting some words that's like, oh, I would love to share this, I would love to share this, but there really wasn't a good opportunity in there, you know, and I didn't want to break into anything, and, and it, it, it was, um, I didn't bring those up here, but bold, confident, joyful believers. We're called in this time to be bold, confident, joyful believers. <clears throat> and in that, I felt like I, 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 I again saw, and I don't know if I shared this last week or not, but Felt like God saying, has my powerful right arm been shortened? It's like, no. The God that holds everything in place, I mean the rotation of the earth, the stars, the sun, has my right arm been shortened? No, absolutely not. He is in control. We believe in his power, in his authority, and we walk in it with bold confidence, joyfully. It's like the, the, the other thing that I saw, then I, I, as soon as I got out of there, I wrote that down. It's like, trust in my power, and again, believe, three words, trust, believe, and receive. Trust in my power, believe my words and my prophets, mm -hmm. and receive my rewards. So good. Like, so good. Well, that's better. The booze have calmed down. I got a few hand claps now. 
Paul, <laughs> my strong Paul, has said we're we're talking about the gospel here now. Is Paul shares? You know, Paul was not one of the original disciples. Paul was not one of the original apostles. He came along uh, quite a bit later. You know, when when Paul came into the scene, but Paul was one who said it is um, in 1 Corinthians 4.20. It's not a gospel of just words. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Power. We've used this scripture before. We've, I've said this before. It is not just about words. It's not just about preaching the gospel. It's a gospel of power. power a kingdom of power. Um, Mark 16, 17 through 20, we don't even need to put it up there. I'm basically just going to uh, paraphrase this, that signs and wonders will follow those who believe. It gets specific. These signs and wonders will follow those who believe. So it's not just a kingdom of words or just preaching the gospel, but the power that accompanies and follows the preaching of the gospel. Trying to figure out how I can look around and see everybody and sit on the... <laughs> okay. Gospel of power. Gospel of power. Where, so, and Matthew 10, 8 says, it talks about, Jesus said, he gave us this like, yeah, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. He's given us instructions as to what we're to do, what those signs and wonders are, and what will accompany those who believe. Yep. So disciples are us. Yep. We are disciples. Yep. So are we called to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons? Yes. 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 All of us, right? Yep. How many saints do we have in here? Hail the saints. Praise God. Understanding. Everyone that raised their hands, boldly and confidently raised their hands, understanding their identity of, as saints of God. We are the saints of God. Yes? Yes. Are we not? Are we saints of God over here? All right, let's raise our hands. Saints of God. All right. There's a bunch of saints in here now. I mean, when Paul was writing to him, as he is writing so much of the, of the New Testament in the epistles, he's saying, saints of, to the saints of, to the saints of. He wouldn't be giving instructions if they were already perfect. Are saints perfect? No. No. Okay. As we move on here, I, I want to... Um, we're going, to, we're going to go to uh, Acts. Go right into Acts. As the new covenant church is being established. One thing that I want to just briefly vi- revisit, I talked, on, I talked and taught some on it last week as we got into that about baptism. What's the first step that we need to do? Repent and be baptized. And be baptized how? Repent and be baptized. Uh, Acts 2, go to 30, 38. Repent and be baptized. Peter said to them, he's speaking to this whole group. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. They come down as Pentecost had been fully unveiled They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. They come down and start to preach. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, by he gets to verse 38, says to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And who is that promise to? To you, to your children, and to those far away. So you remember to, that. And to as many as our Lord will call, and He's still calling. Come on. Is that not why you're here this morning? By chance, by accident? No, you're called. You're called. Okay, 
what I want to talk about is after this has happened, you know, Peter's the one who got up, he preached that stirring message, 3,000 were people were baptized after that, repented and were baptized after that. Now, <clears throat> we'll move to uh, the third chapter, I'm going to start on the first verse of the third chapter. No, I'm going to do the 47th and 48th verse of the second chapter. So the disciples, the disciples had moved on. I mean, this is happening. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 46 says, so they were continuing daily with one accord. One accord, their hearts are tied together. It's one, core, one, one mindset, and that is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power and authority that they were carrying. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. So they were going to the temple every day. Anybody here ready to be coming to church every day? All right. It's open almost every day. I'll challenge you to come on down. We can break bread and pray together. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. That's one of the things that we so want to do, that we so want to promote, is breaking bread from house to house, moving it outside the church, where we're having fellowship in more and more houses, doing life together. The way we encourage one another is to do more than just that two-hour Sunday morning experience. Now, as we move down to chapter 3, Peter and John, you know, one of the things I, I think that how important it is, I have said, I know most of you have heard me say before, show me the three people that you're closest to, and I can prophesy your future. The three people that you spend the most time with and I can tell you what's coming for your future. It's really, really important. I, I think, you know, Jesus had three men that were closest to him. His tightest inner circle. Somebody tell me who those three were. That was quick. And that was right. Peter, James, and John. Those, <clears throat> those are the three men that he was so intimate with that he wanted them to experience some of the most intimate things in his life that he took to the Mount of Transfiguration with him. I was just thinking about that. It's like, wow, wow. It wasn't something that he thought the entire dozen was ready for, but those three were ready for that kind of intimacy that, with him and that experience. It's like, that was the three closest ones to him. Okay, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Let me just take another, another minute here. I spent a little bit of time this morning looking at the, at, at the Jewish clock and the Roman clock and the difference because I was thinking, okay, I need a refresher on the ninth hour, the ninth hour. It's, it's pretty amazing that I just want to teach you this, just take a couple of minutes, and I am certainly not an expert. I had to refresh myself on this just this morning, that the Jewish clock starts <clears throat> excuse me, starts at sunset, the new day begins at sunset, comes around to sunrise. It's like 12-hour shifts where the Roman clock, which is the time that we go by today, the new day starts at midnight, 12.01 is the next day, and then, and then it's finished at noon. So, I, you know, I kind of like the whole Jewish idea where, <laughs> okay, the next day starts at sunset, this one's done. Kind of seems like that's daylight savings time, how we move and shift that around. We, we go from Roman to Jewish to Roman to Jewish. But. So in the ninth hour, which was like the middle of the afternoon, in the middle of the afternoon they were going to the temple, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. So this guy... So their welfare program was to drag this guy who was lame from birth and he's now 40 years old 
over 40, the word says, drag him to the temple, lay him in front of the door, and he has to lean himself up on one arm, hold a cup or whatever, and end up begging for some money. So these guys showed up, and I think this is, this is just absolute paramount to me. As I was studying this and studying it from some more and, and, and meditating on this, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid at the gate daily was carried. And those two ask alms of those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, I mean, he's shaking his cup, he's holding it out there, propped up on one elbow, probably, it says laid there, holding that up, saying, you know, have you got something for me? Have you got something for me? Can you give me a little bit of money? And I was just thinking, how easy that is, especially if you got a little bit of extra change. What's the first thing that you do in those situations? It's like, oh, have I got a little, a little change in my pocket? You know, do I have any dollars? Have I got a five? Or if I really feel convicted, you know, it would be to, to drop some money in there. Isn't, it, isn't that what... You know, they're counting on the compassion, so isn't that what, what we think, you know, and then I'm off the hook. I dropped a little money in there, I'm done, I'm off the hook. But that's not what these guys did, you know. These guys have an absolute calling and a purpose for their lives, right? Yeah. So they see the man and they say, oh, seeing Peter and John re- ready to go into the temple, ask for alms. But Peter fixing his eyes on him, really looking at the guy, focusing his attention on this man and his needs. Put yourself in, the, in this situation. Focusing yourself. You know, we have such busy lives that so often we can walk right by an incredible opportunity, somebody that's desperately in need, somebody that's really hurting, that might be reaching out to us, and it's like, well, here. Here. Or, yeah, give me your name, give me your number, I'll pray for you later. It's like, no, no, no. Peter fixed his eyes on him, looked at the need in the man's life, and says, you know, 50 cents isn't going to do you much good, pal. What I really want to give to you is something that I have, that God has given me, that I can share with you. And I think we can, we can go through life ourselves and end up getting so busy and so focused and so concerned, even about, I mean, this, I even think the next step down, even about going to church. You know, I'm headed to church and I've got a lot to do. I'm a, I'm a busy guy in the church, you know. I got, I got to study, I got to bring the word, I got to do all of this so I don't really have time for this right now. Let me just drop a dollar bill, let me just drop a five here and keep moving. It's like, no, no, no. They stopped, they focused, they set their eyes on him to determine how they could help him by giving him something that they did have to give. Something way more valuable than a little bit of change. So, fixing his eyes on him, he said, look at us. It's like, okay, there's an expectation from his part. Now look at us, make eye contact with us here. Got something that we can do for you that's going to be a whole lot better than drop a five in your bucket. So he gave them his attention. So the lame man looked up. They they got his attention. There was something about them. It's like, okay. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But his expectation most likely was, okay, they really want my attention. They're probably going to give me a 20 or a 50 or a $100 bill. It's like, no, Peter says, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, I give to you. What do we have that's so much more precious than gold or silver? We have Jesus in our lives. We have power in our lives. We have authority in our lives. We have our salvation in our lives. And our eternal, our eternal salvation is secured through our belief in Jesus Christ. We're going to heaven to be with Him. And that's what we can get. Go keep going. I'm just I'm getting excited. Oh. So Peter said, silver and gold, you know, I don't have any of that, but what I have, I'm going to give to you. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yeah, that deserves a hand clap. In the name of Jesus Christ is where my power and authority comes from. Rise up and walk. So, all right, he made the declaration. There was no question in his mind. His faith, his gaze now was confidently on Jesus. Say, all right, you've been down there for 40 years asking for alms. There is something so much more valuable, so much more important than just finances that you need in your life, pal. And I can give that to you. Now, get up on your feet and walk. And the guy is like, What? Yeah, right. You've got something so valuable to give to me. Get up on my feet and walk. Now, Peter's job wasn't finished. You think, you know, Peter was a brawly fisherman. You think somebody who's pulling nets full of fish up, dragging those big heavy nets around. He's a guy who's got some some beef and some brawn. Bethany knows. (laughs) Yeah, you ever had that girl give you a hug? She was a fisherwoman in Alaska. She's pulled nets. So, Peter reached down with his right hand, lifting him up. So, Peter didn't just, didn't just bail on him. He didn't just pray a little prayer over him. He got physical. He got his hands down. He pulled him up onto his feet. The man jumped up on his feet. His ankle bones received strength. He then, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them. So good. Yeah. Something in VSSM, we talked about this on Thursday. The gospel always exceeds our greatest expectations. You know, there's a man who's sitting there and his expectation, like religion can set high, it it can make it to where you think something's going to be great, but you never attain it, right? You can never quite get it. The gospel we have these great expectations, and then Jesus is that much better, and then he's that much better, and he's that much better. So this man sitting there religiously would be his role and his duty in life would be, I have to sit, I have to wait, maybe I'll get money, maybe I can receive this. But the gospel then comes, they come in, Peter comes and brings the gospel filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and he goes, I have something way better than what you think will be good. Here's Jesus. Get up and walk. Like, that's the gospel. Jesus. Like the guy that they tore the, they tore the shingles off the hey, roof and they, and they... What? You're stealing mine. Oh. <laughs> we should have planned a little... Uh, okay. Okay. Well... Why don't you go ahead with a little bit more of yours then, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take off again here. Sounds good. I just think when we're talking about, you can tell we both like, I'm we're passionate to, about I'll this. I'll probably have to jump in front of her here in a second. Uh-huh. That's my turn again. My turn. But we're talking about community. You know, we're talking about the early church, what it looked like for them. These are, this is our inheritance. Like, this is our heritage. This is the church. And so we're hearing these stories I'm going to read something out of Psalms really quick. I feel exactly what you meant by sitting down is hard. I can't do it. Okay, in Psalm 78, it says, I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors, our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. And so this is our heritage. Like, we need to hear this. The children need to hear this. This causes faith. Like, these are testimonies. The Lord did it then. He wants to do it again. Like, when you read the Bible, yeah, it's glorious news. But when you read the Bible, it's to be an invitation it's yeah. always an invitation into what Jesus has. Do it again. Do it again. Yes, do it, do again. it again, Lord. Do it again. That's why we love sharing testimonies. And so when we're reading this, this is our call. Like, this is what we get to do. We get to do this. And when we're talking about community and wanting to establish that, we don't want to just have a club. You know, we don't just want the Boys and Girls Club. They're amazing at what they do. Praise God for them. They do that. We want to be like... 
the New Testament church. We want to be like the book of Acts. That's what community gets to look like. I tell you what, it's amazing when, especially in this season, like there have been times where it's been hard. I know different things have, we've gone through emotionally, you feel it, and you're like, what is happening? And when you have community and you have friends who can be like, okay, well, I'm going to pray for you. Like, I'm feeling weak right now. And they can pray and they can speak life into you. They can prophesy over you. That's the greatest. We are made for that. We need that, which the believers in, in the book of Acts, they met together daily, right? We read that. Well, they also were being persecuted. Heads were being chopped off. They were dying. Like, they needed to meet together, boy. They're like, we better get together. We better pray. And they prayed for boldness. And what would happen? You know, rooms would shake. Like, God would move. Hey, hey, I was going I'm there stealing there yours now. Sorry. But. So, let me just throw in one more, just two verses in here, and then back to you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, conf- yeah. Confirming what you just said, uh, verses 42 and, vo- 42 and 43 in the second chapter, and they, the apostles, continued steadfastly, they, the believers, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking yes. of bread. The breaking of bread. Now, the breaking of bread is not just having you know, a loaf of bread together. That's breaking the body. That, I really believe that when they say in the breaking of bread, that's having communion together in the homes. Mm-hmm. You know, when we did that series there in our, in our house where we're sitting in the living room talking about family communion, I believe that family communion needs to be extended outside the family where we're breaking bread, where we're celebrating what Jesus did for us together even before we have a meal. Yeah. Just like the Last Supper, like Jesus did there, you know, here. So I would just encourage us as we start Mm -hmm. doing this more in homes that we take communion together, that we celebrate what Jesus has done for us even before we end up having lunch or dinner. Mm -hmm. One of my friends, she talked about whenever you're eating, she goes, you know, you're eating bread. Why don't you eat and eat? She goes, so they started making a new habit, which was whenever she'd sit down to eat, she would also read the Bible, whether that's like a lot or a verse, whatever, but it's began to train herself that we don't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so some, I don't say that I do that every time, but it is, it's become a thing in my mind where I'm like, eat and eat. Oh yeah. Then in verse 43, it says, many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Yes. And that's what we get to do. Because who lives in us? Was it the same Jesus then as now? Same Holy Spirit then as now? Well, come on, let's go. (laughs) That makes it exciting. When you read the Bible, it should always be exciting because this is what Jesus paid for. This is what he paid for, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so when we're talking about community, this is an invitation for us. We get to look like this. When we're talking about Okay, Mark 2. Let's go to Mark 2. We can start at verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him down to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. You know, that's what I would think too, right? Oh, (laughs) I can't get in. Hmm. Jesus is in there, the one that we've heard about. He's healing the sick. My friend is paralyzed. I'm finally hearing hope. It's full. I would think, go to the roof. No, but that's what we get to do. When we're talking about community, we want to be those believers where we go, friend is paralyzed. It doesn't look possible right now. Let's go to the roof. That's what we get to do. Mm, Let's go to the roof. Let's tear the roof off. Let's tear the ceiling off. Let's bring them right down to Jesus. And that's what we get to do now. Situation's really hard. Things look really dark. I don't understand. Hmm, let's go to the roof. Things are really messed up in my family right now. I don't know what to do. Mm, I'll take you to the roof. Like we get to be those friends. We get to be the four who go, all right. And that's hard work. Just like you said, with Peter, 
Peter prays for him, and then he takes the step of faith, right, to grab him, pull him up. If you're carrying someone dead weight, that's not easy. Think about it. They have to figure out how to get on the roof. They have to carry their friend up there. And who's watched The Chosen? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's the best. If you haven't watched it, you should watch it. They do a beautiful scene of it. And so imagine you're carrying your friend up. That's what community gets to look like. It means like, I'm going to carry you up. I'm going to get up there. And then they tear the roof off, lower him to Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He heals him. Your sins are forgiven. Pick up your mat and walk. That's it. That's what he did. Yeah. I was just going to say, make sure that your sins are forgiven. Take it. That's the point I was going to make a while ago. She... In case you didn't know, this is my daddy. <laughs> but that's, that's our call for community as believers. Right now, it's so important for us to be aware of that. Because how many have had, personally, have had a hard time throughout the season? Yeah? How many have lots of friends who have had a hard time through the season? So this is our call then. This is our glorious invitation that we get to take action and be the body of Christ. We get to be disciples. We get to be those who bring people right to Jesus. Kim, and I fast forward a little bit. I'm going to tell a little bit of the story. After they healed this man, now they've taken him into the temple. He, he can go in the temple now. So he walks in the temple with them. Everyone is shocked and surprised, just, you know, totally stunned. They're looking at like, how, whoa, whoa, what, what happened to this guy? And so they're just staring at, at, at uh, Peter and John. And so when Peter saw how the people are responding, it says on the 12th verse, so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? It's like people in the church, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? Though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. No, no, no. It was a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied. And Jesus has given us this authority, basically. It's through the name of Jesus. All authority and all glory goes to Jesus. It's not about what we do, but what we don't take credit for, because it's all about Jesus. What he's done. Fast forwarding down, the, the, see the, the guys, the, the people in the establishment of the church, in the establishment of the temple and the high priests and all, they were not at all happy with this because they didn't believe in this Jesus thing. So they started to punish these guys. They wanted to punish them so badly, but the people had seen the incredible miracle that they did. It was standing in front of them. So they rebuked these guys quietly, silently. They took them off, rebuked them and said, don't you ever teach anymore in this name of Jesus. They threatened them and threatened them and threatened them. And I, I want to read one more thing before I go into what happened after the threatening, because this was over two days, over two days. They took these guys to jail, for one thing. They put them in jail overnight. But we don't have time to read all this. We have quite a bit we want to cover. But one of the things that we do have time for is verse 19, 319. We just did 12, this is 19. Repent, therefore. This is what they're telling these guys. Here's what you need to do. Repent, therefore. Be converted, converted to believe in Jesus, mm -hmm. that your sins may be blotted out. Everybody just say, wiped out. Wiped out. Blotted out, so that times of refreshing, what sometimes we so desperately need is just to be refreshed, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Yes. Oh. Why is the presence of the Lord so valuable and so important? Not only are we given power, are we given authority, are we given direction, but we are just refreshed yes. in that presence. Yes, we are. The other day, it's, uh, it's been a while, uh, 
I, I remember there was a couple that, that had come to the front, that, and she very much, the, the lady, the woman in this, had been very much highlighted to me, and I really felt like I had something from God for her, something to deliver to her from God. Uh, <clears throat> her husband was with her, and he was standing very close to her, and, and uh, you know, sometimes that's awkward, men praying for women, that kind of thing. Her husband was standing very, very close to her, and I, and I said, and uh, I, he, in fact, he was like rubbing her shoulders and stuff, and I said, man, I, I feel like God has something very special for her right now. Holy Spirit wants to give her something. So I, I, I asked, I believe God has something for you. I mean, I, that's, I asked, what's her, what's the singer lady that we, at one time, the Nutrisystem lady. Marie Osmond. I remember asking Marie Osmond, Marie, God has something for you. Are you interested in it? And she said the same thing. Uh, anything, I don't know, whatever you need. She said, no, not what I need. God has something for you. Are you interested in it? You come back and say, yes, yes. Same thing to another lady here. It's like her husband was with her and standing very, very close to her. In fact, he's like rubbing her shoulders and, and, and holding her. And so I just, I, I just went, I said, I really believe God has something special for her. Would you mind giving her just a little bit of space, but keeping your ear right up here so you can hear what I say so it doesn't feel strange or weird or anything? Oh, oh, sure, sure, sure. So we backed up and ended up just taking her hands, looking her in the eye, speaking what Holy Spirit directed me to, and she's like, and she was out on the floor for probably 20 or 30 minutes as the Holy Spirit was ministering to her exactly what he had for her. An absolute time of refreshing. Yes. Just in his presence, his, his fullness of joy, and in his presence when we will allow. But just like the man down there, he had to look up and he had to allow. Yes. There was, it was his part too. And reach up his hand. And I think something that's so important is listening. You know, what's the Lord saying? Because so it's really easy for us to step past it or to kind of push it aside. But if we look just two glorious stories, um, Acts 8, verse 26. This is talking about Philip and the eunuch. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down to the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. So he did it. He heard it. The angel of the Lord said it. So he started out and met the treasure of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Candake. Go down. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip. Who said it to Philip? Holy Spirit. Who's in you? Who loves to talk to you? That's right. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk along beside the carriage. So Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, Do you understand what you are reading? The man replied, How can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For this life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's water. Why can't I be baptized? And he ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water. Philip baptized him. This is so fun. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. I love it. Meanwhile, Philip, just being obedient to the Holy Spirit, Philip found himself further north at the town of Azotus, and then he preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea, which is just so beautiful because Philip... He's just listening to the Holy Spirit. He's walking. What does Holy Spirit say? Go do this. He does it. What happens? Guy gets saved. Next thing you know, Philip gets translated in the Spirit to a different area. And he's just like, like, imagine that. Literally, you go to pray for someone, you're there, and then all of a sudden, you're not. They'd just be like, Jesus, this is really cool. I'm going to keep following you. I don't know what happened. This is awesome. 
and he just keeps preaching the good news. But these are people who just love Jesus. They were obedient to the Holy Spirit. They listened to the Holy Spirit. They were disciples. Are we disciples? This is our heritage. That's what life gets to look like with Jesus. So when you hear this, this should stir up a faith in you and a hunger. That's why it's so important that we go over these. Okay, then uh, getting back to the getting back to these uh, to uh, Peter and John, where they've seen this man. He jumped up. He's been in the temple. You know, freaked all of the leaders out there in the temple because of what had happened in the name of Jesus. So they threw those two guys in jail, kept them overnight, brought them out the next morning, surrounded them, had this 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 talk with them. But these guys, in let's go to. Uh, they, they warned him and they threatened him and threatened him. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we did it in the name of Jesus, the one God raised from the dead. I just encourage you to read all of this. But now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, so they've called him out, they're surrounding him by the chief priests of the temple, by the Sadducees, they're... You know, there all of these people that should just intimidate the daylights out of these two guys. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, everybody say boldness. Boldness. boldness and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Let's go. Uneducated, untrained men by these well-trained men that are surrounding them to intimidate them, to threaten the daylights out of them. They realized that they marveled at their boldness. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Come on. How important is the presence? The most important. <laughs> they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. And seeing that the man was standing alone, what could they say against it? Now, there's one, one, one more really big point that I want to make here. This is something that's relevant and pertinent to today, to what we're experiencing today. After they've given them all of these threats, chastised them, threatened and threatened. Verse 19, But Peter and John answered these men and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to listen to God, you judge. But we cannot speak the things but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Come on. So you be the judge. Do I listen to God or do I worry about what man is saying? Yeah. Who votes for God? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. All right, babe, go ahead. Another story that's so important. So we know Paul and we're like, oh, Paul is so amazing. We love Paul. He's my fave. He is. Acts 9. So Saul, and this is when he's still Saul, he was going around killing Christians. Literally murdering Christians. You speak of Jesus, he was going to murder you. Like he was going to go in house, pull people out, kill them. And I love this so much. Verse 3. As he was, approached, um, as he was approaching Damascus on the mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. Can you imagine that? Oh, I love that. <laughs> Saul picked himself up off the ground but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street, Straight Street, to the house of Judas, when you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, 
I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. <laughs> He's killing them. They're dying. I don't think that's the right guy, Lord. Jail. And, and he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. He's got authority to arrest you if you believe in Jesus. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went, found Saul, He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, would you say that? (laughs) I mean, you're going up to the guy who who would literally kill you or throw you in prison. Brother Saul. (laughs) Talk about obedience to the voice of God. (laughs) Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food, hallelujah, and regained his strength. And then, goes on, he hangs out with them. They're preaching. He just starts preaching the gospel like crazy. What would have happened if Ananias wasn't obedient to the voice of God? Who would have written that other two-thirds of the Bible? Who would have written the the New New Testament? Testament, You know, it's like... Who would have written it? But I love that. Think about the rewards in heaven Ananias is going to have now, too. Are you serious? That's boldness. He's just... So key, yeah. Yes. I mean, one of us. God uses his obedient... We would have to call him bold and confident to be able to do that, wouldn't we? Yes, we would. (laughs) Yes, we would. I want to move back to uh, fourth fourth chapter here and and talk about Peter and John again. After after they've talked, after they decided these guys had to have been with Jesus, and what is more right, that we listen to God or that we worry about what you guys have to say. And so they, they, they took off. They went to go be back with the rest of the believers. And Verse 29 down here, I just want to read this. They get with the believers and they start to pray. They told them everything that had happened, and now in verse 29, they pray. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. And they say... Jesus, by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of Jesus Christ. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. You know, we had uh, some testimonies that we really wanted to share, but we've pretty much used up our time. Uh, we, we had, when we went to Mexico last year, oh my goodness, we had so many testimonies that we brought back. We ended up with some, some video and some pictures and stuff. It's of God's goodness, where for one thing, people were laying all over the floor, just receiving and being refreshed by God's goodness. But several people were healed. There was healings from cancer. There was uh, a blind eye. Two, two times in two different churches, a blind eye was healed. We just got to see amazing, amazing, incredible healings over there. It's just like, but we've seen them here as well. We have seen healings here as well. Praise Jesus. And even on a regular basis. And we started at one time to, to get videos of those so we could post them, but we haven't done one of those for probably a year or two. Uh, we, we get excited about it, and, and it's so awesome what, what God does that we forget about the video part of it. But we do have some. Someday we're going to end up showing these. Today is not the day. But I really believe, as, as we've shared about boldness, have you got more that you want to share before we... Just one, okay. one little portion here in Acts 5, verse 12. These are the things that, that grip me because it's an invitation. I haven't seen it yet to this measure, 
but it can look like this. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade, but no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. I mean, these are people who are going in, seeing people healed left and right, delivered, and the people around the city, they obviously, they had high regards for them, but they're kind of scared of them. I, I want to be that fiery-eyed evangelist where they're like, I have a lot of respect for her, but she kind of scares me a little bit. I, she kind of scares me a little bit. <laughs> Yet more and more, people believed and were brought to the Lord. Crowds of both men and women. As a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. I just love it because these people just love Jesus. You know, Peter, he just loved Jesus. It wasn't thinking, look at my shadow. He's thinking, I met Jesus. I was with him. And he's wonderful. And you need him. I don't have silver and gold. I have something so much better. This is Jesus. So much so that people were bringing sick people to the streets. Like, that's what it gets to look like for us. It's not that, oh, we're so amazing. We're amazing because we have Jesus. <laughs> We've met him. He's real. He's manifested himself to us. We've got to see him heal the sick. We've got to see him bring hope to families. We've got to see resurrection life. And he's wonderful. And that's, that's what we're talking about here. That's the invitation is we've seen him. We've met him. You've got to meet him. <laughs> He's wonderful, and that's what we get to do as believers. It can look like that. Like, what if it looked like that in the Treasure Valley? What if people were like, those people at Valley Church are going to be there on Sunday morning. I am bringing my cousin who's sick. I'm bringing this person because I know that they've met Jesus. There's something different about them. Oh. And we just hear, do it again. Do it, again, do it again, God. Do, do it again. again. Do it again. Do it again, God. Do it God. again. Do it again, Lord, in us. Do it again, Jesus. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Do it again, Jesus. Do it again. Do it again. Do, do it, it again. again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. I, I really, really believe. Is, is there something that you want? I believe that we have something for you this morning. We could gather around the front. We can pray some more. We would like to see this place just start shaking and Holy Spirit fill everybody. Holy Spirit fill, fill everybody this morning. I believe that there's healings this morning. Anybody need healing in their body this morning? Hey, raise your hand. Anybody you need, need healing. healing in their body this morning? Let's, let's come down. If you need healing in your body this morning, let's come down around the front. Bethany, you, you guys want to just scoot over a little bit? Let's just leave the front open. Anybody who needs healing in their body this morning, we say, do it again, Lord. Do it again. We're believing again. We believe your words. We believe your testimonies. We believe we have full expectation that everything you've promised in here is for us today. Today, today, we're trusting and believing in you. We're believing in your word. You've called us to be bold, bold Christians, where we stand on our faith, knowing that your right hand has not been shortened. You are all powerful. We believe in your word, we believe in your promises. And you have given us really clear direction. Father, I just give you, I, I thank you this morning. I thank you this morning. I thank you for each one that's gathered here this morning as your word has, has fallen on their ears, that their ears would be open not only to hear, but to receive, to trust, and believe that you have the answers. Everybody say with me, you have the answer. You have the power. You have the love. And we receive that love. 
And everybody, if you would extend your hands towards the people that are gathered right here for healing. Uh, let's, could we a little bit tighter for healing right here? You want healing. You want healing. Now I would like the whole congregation, anybody that wants to be a part of this. I believe this morning that we're going to see healing. I know that we're going to see some healings take place here this morning. So I would encourage believers to surround them. Let's move around them. You don't need to touch them, but extend your hands toward them. And we're going to pray together. We're going to lift the roof on this place. I encourage you to pray. Some of you be praying in the Spirit praying in tongues because we're ready to see God's miracles working in here this morning. Father, we just thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Yes, Jared. 